Welcome to NAHUC's Virtual Lending Library. NAHUC is a professional organization for health unit coordinators and other healthcare professionals performing similar tasks. NAHUC is the provider of professional development for healthcare team members. NAHUC is pleased to offer the webinar, Mental Health, The Shrouded Pandemic, as presented by Freydert Health in Wisconsin. We are grateful to Freydert Health for providing this content. This presentation first debuted in October 2022 as a continuing education webinar offered by Freydert Health. Information about obtaining NAHUC content hours through NAHUC's virtual lending library can be found at the end of this presentation and on the NAHUC website www.nahuc.org. That's www.nahuc.org. My name is Christopher Anderson, Manager of Patient Systems and Support here at Freighter Hospital. And I'd like to welcome you all to day two of this two-part series of Mental Health, The Shrouded Pandemic. This webinar is brought to you by the National Association of Health Unit Coordinators and is sponsored by Freighter Hospital. You'll see the mission and vision of both over the course of this webinar, and I encourage you to read them. You'll also see the websites www.nahuc.org NAHUC, and www.freighter.com. Before the day is out, please visit for more information. At the end of this webinar, you'll receive a survey in your inbox that will act as your application to continuing education credits, as well as feedback for the webinar. We're privileged to have an audience spanning coast to coast, and in fact, a few international attendees as well. This series aims to pierce the taboo that mental health fosters, after all, one in five adults experience a form of mental illness each year. I hope you all had a chance to see the one last week. We heard from some fantastic speakers. If you didn't, it's recorded. Technical difficulties and all. Today, we have some wonderful specialists as well. Dr. Bert Berger from Veteran Affairs Hospital. Dr. Himanshu Agarwal from our very own Medical College of Wisconsin. And M. Scahill from the Mental Health America. First, let me introduce Dr. Bert Berger. Dr. Berger is a clinical psychologist and is division manager of the mental health at the Milwaukee VA Medical Center. He is assistant professor and vice chair for the veteran issues in the psychiatry department at MCW. His specialties include veterans, working on inpatient mental health units with people that have serious mental illnesses and in suicide prevention activities. I now present to you Dr. Bert Berger. Good morning. Um, glad to be able to do this uh, webinar with everybody. Um, and glad you all could join us this morning. So I'm going to be talking about mental health issues in the United States, uh, talking about uh, just some of the issues around mental health, as well as trends and then some treatment options that are available. Um, I'll be um, kind of going through my PowerPoint slides and, and talking, and at the end, I'll have time for some questions. So I'm going to share my, my screen here. So we should be able to move right along here. Great. Okay. Got my little power laser thing here, so um, I'll get started. So mental health illness trends in the United States. So um, as Christopher mentioned, mental health illnesses are common in the United States. Nearly one in five U.S. adults live with mental illness. So that's about 52.9 million in 2020. A lot of my data will be in my talk will be a lot about during 2020. That's some of the latest data we have on some of these issues. So there are many different mental illnesses um, and I want to, I'll talk a little bit about the severity 
and range from mild to moderate to severe. Because um, that's how uh, we kind of look at the the severity and the differences across the across the range of different illnesses. So I uh, just want to define what I'm going to be talking about a little bit. Um, so any mental illness is AMI, is defined as a mental, behavioral, or emotional disorder. And it can range really from impact from no impairment to mild, moderate, and even severe. Um, so th this is really the catch-all uh, for the different disorders. And then um, the other one that I'll be talking about are serious mental illnesses. And these are defined also as mental, behavioral, or emotional disorders resulting in serious functional impairment. So this is uh, more severe and, and where we do have functional impairment. Um, substantially interferes and limits one's more major life activities. So this is where we usually see people that may be on, on disability. So let me, I'm just gonna kind of cover a range of, of mental disorders and, and give you also some links if you have the slides um, that you can uh, learn much more about all the different mental disorders and conditions. So um, they range from anxiety disorders, depressive, eating disorders, obsessive compulsive, bipolar disorders, uh, psychosis, um, and then substance abuse. Um, there are also sleep-wake disorders where if you're not sleeping well, that really can disrupt your day. So here's the here's the really a link of the different mental disorders and conditions that are um, we typically um, work with and and treat. Um, and this is from the National Institute of Mental Health. So all of these are um, active hyperlinks in the slides. <clears throat> and I'm just going to go through a couple of these just to show you what these um, uh, brochures and fact sheets look like a little bit and talk about a couple of different disorders. And then I'll talk a little bit more about some of the trends that we're seeing uh, with mental disorders throughout the country. So we want to talk first about panic disorder. This is one that kind of sneaks up on people sometimes. Um, and it, it sometimes can mimic uh, someone having a heart attack. Um, so this is, and some of you may have actually felt this. Um, and if, if and, and when I'm talking about mental disorders, I'm not talking about when you're just having a bad day. This is, we're talking about uh, situations that are really impairing your ability to get to work uh, working with doing doing things with friends and other kind of um, things in your life. So uh, when we have a mental disorder, it, it's really going to be uh, very upsetting and difficult to deal with. So a panic disorder is really that it's a it's a fear or anxiety disorder. This is one one of the more common disorders are, are anxiety disorders. And sometimes when you just feel your heart pounding and and you start breathing quickly. Your, your body can kind of get into this uh, panic attack. They can occur unpredictably, and sometimes it doesn't seem like there's a trigger. Um, so there's more detail about this if you want to check it out at the NIH um, website. Another disorder is very common. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard about depression. And it's really when someone feels sad or low, but uh, Usually the feelings will pass with a little time. Um, that's what how most, you know, everybody can sometimes can have a bad day, right? <clears throat> Depression or major depressive disorder <clears throat> is much different. This is where you can have severe symptoms that affect how you feel, think, and handle daily activities. <clears throat> and it affects everybody. It, it's really no particular group that uh, it affects more or less. And there are many different uh, factors that can play in the development of depression, including genetic, biological, environmental, and psychological factors. So th those, are, those are just a couple examples. I won't have time to talk about every mental disorder, of course, because um, there, there are many in there. Um, each of them have their own symptoms. And uh, what we use to determine um, diagnosis for 
mental disorders is the diagnostic uh, statistical manual uh, uh, in psychiatry. Um, so I want to talk a little bit now about just mental illness trends in the United States. Um, as we're talking, this is a kind of a shrouded kind of thing, mental illness. We don't, we really don't see somebody with uh, when we see them and talk to them, you may not know that they're dealing with a mental illness. And so I, I want to talk about some of the trends so we get an idea of um, how prevalent and and what different areas we see it in. So when we're talking about trends, I thought this was a cute slide, just talking about positive trends, of course, means it's increasing. Negative trends, typically it's decreasing. No trend, it's kind of about the same. So I didn't find a lot of um, um, the information about trends over time for every Ill illness, but so I, I just looked at the depression by episode um, and by age and by year, because there's a pretty significant difference of the age of the person and how, off, how we've been seeing depression um, trending. So you can see, on this first line, uh, people 26 and older, um, you know, there's some slight increases in 2009, um, but the, some decreases in 2015 through 2018. And if you think about that, it was a pretty good financial time. Um, and then this is when beginnings of COVID up to 2020. Um, and slight de increase we can see in the People older than 26. Now, this is interesting though that adolescents, we've been seeing a very significant increase in depressive episodes over the past uh, 10 years, basically, and as well as uh, young adults, so 18 to 25. Uh, it's really not understood what is going on that this is trending so much, but uh, it's definitely something to be aware of and, and to talk. Um, to your children. If you're older and you have children in those ages, uh, it's probably a good idea just to check it out and see what if they're appearing to have uh, kind of some symptoms, sadness, not interacting as well. Um, really maybe find out because we've definitely seen an increase of depression over the years. Um, this does not necessarily apply to other disorders. Um, anxiety um, is also noted to be uh, pretty significant. And I, I really don't have a lot of other data about the other things, but this one was most um, significant from what I was looking at. So I did then focus a bit more about just so uh, remember I talked about all mental illnesses, AMI. So or any mental illness among US adults in 2020. So this is just after uh, COVID began. Um, and you can see approximately 20 percent, 21 percent of U.S. adults have had um, a mental illness in the past year in 2020. The data probably is similar at the current time. And you can see there's a difference between men and women. Also in age, as I talked about earlier, um, with depression, but that also applies to any mental illness. And then you can see uh, individuals that are of mixed race have a higher prevalence of any mental illness as well. And this is just uh, some of the discussion I just talked about with that graph. So serious mental illness uh, is, uh, you know, the one where we see uh, is very serious and, and a lot of times people are on disability. These are some of the, um, um, disorders for psychosis, bipolar disorder, you know, serious depression, serious dep anxiety where a person has difficulty leaving the home, uh, such as agoraphobia, ag agoraphobia or some other condition. So again, here we see uh, also uh, women have a higher uh, prevalence rate. Uh, again, the, our younger population has a higher rate or prevalence rate. And again, um, mixed race and white, as well as um, uh, 
I believe this is um, American Indian, um, Alaska Natives are also at a higher rate for serious mental illness. And uh, again, this is uh, just some of the what I just talked about. And so now I want to talk a little bit about um, how many people are actually receiving um, services for mental health. So, you know, we have quite a high rate of mental illness throughout the country. And one of the things you'll notice on the slide is that it's, it's concerning because only about 46 people, 46 percent of the people with a mental illness are seeking or receiving treatment. This is again 2020 data. Um, so that would suggest what about 55 percent do not seek treatment. Women are more likely to seek treatment than men. And uh, our older population tend to also seek treatment. Uh, quite a few in the younger population. Um, and but again, it, you know, only about half, less than half of the people with me mental illness of any mental illness seek treatment. Um, more likely, white people are able to obtain treatment. So um, I do want to talk a little bit about just what may be a factor in people not seeking treatment. Um, and this uh, is, we call this stigma and discrimination. There's kind of some self-discrimination that people with mental illness have. And this refers to their own negative attitudes about um, mental illnesses uh, toward themselves, really, internalized shame and that they feel like, you know, they may not be worthy. They may feel like this is, this is you know, they can't talk to somebody about it. Uh, they feel bad about um, the condition. Um, and then there's also a lot of public stigma, of course, about uh, uh, people with mental illness. We see that in the media and uh, how it can be very negative and discriminatory, discriminatory attitudes. That people have toward mental illness. This will, of course, then uh, make people not really feel like they should tell anybody about it or even seek treatment. So it's important that we talk about it. Like this uh, conference is is excellent for us to talk about these issues and get the word out that uh, these issues are real and and people need treatment and treatment is available. Treatment is out there. Um, there's also institutional stigma. And this is a more systematic, systemic kind of involving policies, government, private organizations that intentionally or unintentionally limit opportunities for people with mental illness. So we do have lower funding for mental illness research. Um, there's like way more research dollars available for um, certain mental illness as well. So for like suicide prevention, there's very little research around suicide prevention, but then other types of um, research there is. Um, so it, it's uh, definitely something that we want to advocate for is talking about uh, the issues around mental illness and making sure people have access and can get it. We'll talk a little bit more about mental illness and stigma discrimination. Uh, one study in April of 2020 looked at a recent example of the popular film Joker, which is uh, one of those Batman movies who portrayed the lead character as a person with mental illness who uh, becomes extremely violent. And the study actually found that viewing the film was associated with low, higher levels, levels of prejudice toward those with any with mental illness. Um, so the Joker may actually increase the stigma that people have about someone with mental illness. And then uh, also decrease the people seeking help when they uh, may identify with uh, someone like that has a mental illness um, and this may decrease their, their thoughts about getting help or telling people about what they're dealing with. 
So what are some things to do to help address uh, stigma and discrimination? Uh, so the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, uh, which is a, a self-help uh, organization that is uh, across the country, has uh, great resources. Um, and, and they have these uh, particular bullet points uh, that are important to talk openly about mental illness, uh, sharing it, issues around on social media, educate yourself and others. So attending these uh, webinars about this so you can understand and respond to misconceptions uh, and negative comments from other people. Be conscious of language. So uh, around like suicide, uh, we don't say commit suicide because it's uh, suggesting that someone's committing a crime. So we say uh, instead that someone has died by suicide. So that's the appropriate language because uh, otherwise it labels somebody if they have suicidal thoughts or they've died by suicide. Um, it can be really difficult for survivors also to hear that. Um, encourage equality between physical and mental illness. So when we're making, we're developing research or advocating for research, make sure we include mental illness mental health in the treatment options. Show compassion with those with mental illness. Um, be honest about treatment. So normalize um, mental health treatment just because you're going to see your psychologist or psychiatrist or other provider, therapist, psychotherapist, social worker. Um, it's healthcare. It's healthcare like any other healthcare. So really to make it is you know, yeah, I need to go see the doctor. It doesn't matter. It's a psychiatrist. That, that's fine. You know, need to normalize some of the issues around uh, getting treatment, and also let the media know about how the language and how uh, things are discussed can stigmatize um, people in the population. And we want to really empower people, fight stigma by um, doing things to show that we. Um, are proud of ourselves, even if we do have mental health problems. So, um, so wouldn't want to, okay, we move on to the next kind of area. Uh, so White House, there was a White House report just in May of 2022, and really talked about what we can do or what's needed, what maybe is needed for reducing the economic burden of mental health needs. Because uh, it's recognized in the, in, the, in the country that there is a huge burden for people with mental illness in our country. Um, that people um, with mental health issues and if they're not able to work get, or get treatment, that they um, are not working. Um, not being as productive, not able to do things that they like to do. But if they had treatment, this could really change the game here. So um, what are ways we can reduce the economic burden of unmet mental health needs? And, and um, this report was, um, gives a, a, a many ideas. Um, <clears throat> But uh, to make it happen, uh, that a lot needs to have, be done yet. So this slide talks about the top five reasons for not receiving mental health services in the past year. And this was a survey um, put out to the, basically ar around the country and the results from uh, SAMHSA, which is Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Um, and the respondents did, were able to report, you know, select more than just um, one item. So the biggest one was people are not able to afford the cost. So um, remember our other slide suggested about 45, I mean, about 55% of people do not seek treatment. Well, cost appears to be a huge issue. Being able to get, you know, have the money and be able to afford co-pays or, if they don't have insurance just to pay for it. Uh, so we need, we need really need to have additional ways for people to get mental health treatment. Some people just don't know where to go. It's maybe not out there. People aren't, aren't sharing. 
options for people to get help. Some people have the stigma about uh, being worried that they're gonna be committed or they'll have to take medication. They'll be locked up in some way. So you can see that's a pretty high percentage, about 25% of people uh, will not seek treatment because of that. Uh, so it's important that we educate people about seeking treatment is, is not something where it's gonna be locked up. Um, um, many people also feel like they can handle the issues, they can they can deal with it on their own. <clears throat> and maybe some of them can, um, but um, many times that they can um, get the best of them and creep up on them. And um, it's important for them to know that treatment is out there. And then insurance doesn't pay enough for mental health services. So we can see that a lot of the financial issues are, are huge here for people seeking mental health treatment. And it's important that we advocate for more services, more access for mental health issues. Um, and this is across the country. Um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about veteran issues since that's a key um, piece of work that I do and, and a little bit of a different focus. Um, but uh, I'll take questions at the end, but as you have questions, um, you can of course put them in the chat and, and then I'll have a chance to answer some questions. But uh, this is kind of around midpoint where I'm gonna switch over to mental health um, with veterans and those issues. But uh, please uh, have, have some questions, that would be great. So, Veterans and, and service office, you know, active service officers um, are really important uh, part of our country. They've kept us safe. I'm not a veteran myself, but I've been working in the VA for about 30 years now, and it's just like the best job you could ever have uh, to work with veterans and, and help take care of them. If I talk about um, uh, veterans, it's important that uh, you understand that many veterans do not have PTSD, do not have a serious mental illness, um, but they do have these conditions similar to the rest of the population. Some areas there are higher rates because with PTSD and combat issues, but uh, many of our veterans are very proud and, and have difficulty seeking treatment when they have a problem. But also, we want to be careful not to stigmatize that just because they're a veteran, that they are potentially this angry person that's going to go off on them, because that's not the case. So I just want to make that clear before I start talking about some of this. So um, there are about 18 million veterans and about 2 million active duty reserve service members. And, and since 2000, one, since 9-11, uh, there have been about 2.8 million active duty military personnel deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan, and beyond, leading to increased numbers of combat veterans among the population. I know that's been about 20 some years now. Um, and so, but uh, some of the, the combat is just uh, wrapped up, you know, in the past couple of years. So we've had some veterans that have multiple um, tours in combat, and about 6% of the U.S. population that have served or are serving in the military. But uh, the one thing to know, too, is that um, when service members come back and become a veteran, um, it does affect family members and, and how they adjust. And that first year is really important for adjustment for veterans when they come back from the service. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of those things that uh, uh, veterans have that are challenging as a result of their time in the service. And you can see my graphic over here is about uh, a veteran's worst, worst wounds. You know, we do see some with uh, head injuries and things like that, that you don't really see. And also um, the mental health issues you don't, you don't see when they're a veteran and they've gone through uh, some trauma or difficulty during the service. Um, so 
I'll talk a little bit about post-traumatic stress disorder. And most of you, I imagine, have heard about this. It's uh, relatively a new diagnosis, actually, since Vietnam is when the diagnosis became official um, in the 19, late 1970s, 1980s is when uh, PTSD was um, considered a, a psychiatric diagnosis. Before that, uh, they talked like from the time of Civil War, it's called Soldier's Heart. First World War, it was called Shell Shock. And then um, in World War II, also Shell Shock. And combat fatigue around Vietnam War. So it wasn't really considered like a diagnosis, even during the Vietnam War. Um, so PTSD is complex and involving evolving biological, psychological, and social entity. So it makes it difficult to study and, and diagnose. Um, it's also often researched uh, re regarding war and disaster sur survivors, but um, anybody can develop post-traumatic stress disorder if they've been in a, a violent event such as assault, disasters, terror attacks, um, sexual assaults, any kind of violent uh, situation, car accidents, people can develop PTSD from. So, and there is a, and this is a link here to the PTSD fact sheet with NIMH. Um, and again, uh, um, it really is uh, an anxiety disorder and, uh, and is something that's considered to um, follow after the trauma. Some people experience the trauma and are able to respond to it and adjust to it and don't develop PTSD. So, really, PTSD is. Anxiety and other and um, flight or flight responses to uh, um, a difficult and traumatic experience. At least thirty days after the trauma, that those symptoms continue. But again, sometimes people are um, pretty tough and and kind of cope with the trauma and uh, move on and live. Of a regular life after trauma. And some, it comes back and it, it bothers them years later. So um, again, that's why it's a, sometimes difficult to um, really understand and diagnose and because it affects people in different ways, that trauma. Another one that's very common in veterans is depression. So, um, you know, some people, like I said, uh, we'll have more PTSD sometimes, symptoms. Sometimes people develop more depressive symptoms. And this can be uh, somewhat due to separation from loved ones, their support systems, um, stressors of combat, and, and other things. Uh, so we see depression both in active duty and in the veteran populations. And actually, there's been an increase of depression oh, since the deployment. The 9/11 from 11% of active duty to more of about 15% after deployment. Um, in the past uh, 20 years or so, um, we've seen the rate of suicide also increasing, and this is not only the veteran population, but the uh, overall suicide rate in the United States has increased by about 30% from uh, 1999 to actually more recently, uh, up until 2020. Uh, the rate has continued to climb. Um, and with veterans, um, it's actually climbed more. Up. There's been a higher rate of, of suicides than the general population. Uh, over the past 20 years. So this is an alarming and, and uh, concerning issue for the United States Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, our work is really important that we provide that treatment for veterans as quickly as we can and as uh, comprehensively and as, as much intensity as needed for veterans that are experiencing the PTSD, the impression, um, and those things that can lead to suicide. 
The only change in the suicide rate was just recently in the latest VA report in 2022, which came out just this past September, uh, there was a decrease of 343 fewer deaths by suicide in our veteran um, population. Uh, still way higher than it was in 1999. Uh, we've maybe gotten to the rate of when it was in 2016. So we're still above the 6,000 deaths per year for veterans. Uh, so this is a, a huge priority for the VA and a lot of what we're working on. And some of the work we do uh, transfers over to the general population as well. Um, and uh, as I mentioned previously, um, research has really shown that uh, veterans that are discharged from the military, it's their first year is really when uh, there's huge concerns. Um, in 2018, a presidential executive order was signed to improve suicide prevention services for veterans during this transition to civilian life. So we've been developing different ways to mentor and work with veterans shortly after discharge. And the DOD or Def Department of Defense has uh, made it a priority. Um, suicide rates doubled between 20, 2000 and 2012, but um, there's been not as many, not as much increase in suicides of active military um, so the, the DOD has been um, doing some work really to identify um, soldiers that are dealing with a depression and potential suicide. One of the things I just say also about uh, veterans and suicide and the rest of the population is that firearms are, are the uh, most, most common means that people use to die from suicide. In the general population, it's about 50% of people die using a firearm. In the veteran population, it's closer to 70%, a little higher in the male veteran population. So we know that uh, decreasing access to lethal means such as firearms uh, is actually a way we can decrease the rate of suicide. So the VA is working on many ways to educate people about safe firearm storage. Uh, in Wisconsin and Colorado, Washington State, a number of other states, we, there are programs where people can take their firearms to a local gun range or gun short store, um, and they can um, drop off their guns temporarily if they're in a crisis, and the firearm store will hold on to the guns. Um, in Wisconsin, you can uh, search for betherewis.org. Uh, and you'll find more information about that program here in Wisconsin. And we have links to some of the other states that provide that. Another area is uh, substance use disorders. Um, so SUD includes alcohol is a really huge problem in our uh, veteran population. About 30% of um, military personnel um, completed suicides. Um, and around 20% of deaths are attributed to uh, use of alcohol or drug use. So again, the, this is a complication for uh, depression and suicide. Um, and it's the fourth leading cause of preventable death is alcohol in our general population. 31% uh, of driving related fatalities involve alcohol. And um, not talking so much about uh, the opioid, but we also know that opioid and fentanyl Overdoses are a huge problem in our veteran population and in our general population. So seeking treatment, getting treatment for substance abuse is, is as high a priority as any other mental health problem. Okay, I wanna talk just a little bit about COVID and mental health issues, so what we've been seeing. Um, so, wasn't able to find a kind of comprehensive study that talked about this. So I went right to the CDC and they have um, a survey that they've been giving to people over the past, um, well, it started in April of 2023 and uh, some of the most recent data I was able to find was in April of 2022. So there's a, they have just tons of data, data sites. It's, it's crazy the amount of data they have. 
Um, and so I was able to kind of pull up the data set and, and kind of look to see a couple findings that I, I saw. Um, if you were to look, and so this, this um, data is from uh, the CDC um, sending a survey, 20 minute survey to households across the country. And it's a federal statistical system that anybody can actually access. And I just looked at a couple things. They had other things you could look at, but just the increase, I just was interested how, how many people are using medication prescriptions for mental health. And what I found was from August of 2020, there were 19.5% of people uh, were using medications for mental illness, for mental health. Uh, so that was, you know, early in our, uh, during COVID. So then the past up until recently, you can see it was a 19% use uh, and currently it's 23% increase of medication prescriptions. Maybe the increases because people are aware of mental illness and, and more likely to seek treatment, or it could be that people are suffering for, from additional uh, problems due to COVID and seeking out help for their mental health condition. It also increase in, in counseling and therapy. Uh, it's not a huge increase, but uh, it, it, I think it's nearing uh, statistical significance. Um, I didn't quite look at the stats behind it, but you can see it's generally a trend that uh, appears to be going up, that uh, people are getting more treatment over the past two years. Um, and this was, of course, during COVID. Um, I, hopefully that some of this is because there's additional access. Um, uh, in mental health, we're able to do much more telehealth work and, and people can get access to mental health care using telemedicine techniques, which uh, we've been finding are quite effective. So hopefully some of the increase is also because there's increased access and not only because that uh, people are suffering from more mental health problems. So I'm going to talk uh, got a little more time. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our mental health um, treatment approaches and options. And I really want to focus and state clearly that um, and let you know that uh, treatment works. So it's uh, important if you are suffering from some kind of mental health problem to um, seek out help, seek out treatment. So um, let me get right into this. So there are a number of different treatment approaches and options. Um, and so we have outpatient treatment, which is usually where people start. Um, and they're suffering from uh, depression, severe anxiety, panic attacks, uh, been in a trauma, have anxiety. Um, it's important to call your hospital, um, let them know, talk to your doctor, and if you need help, they can they can help you connect with. Um, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, social worker, uh, psychotherapist uh, to get you started. Um, and that initial assessment is when they'll determine what might be the best treatment. A lot of times outpatient treatment can involve psychotherapy and medications. Um, we also have uh, things we call evidence-based psychotherapy, which are research-backed um, research that is backed by, um, I'm sorry, psychotherapy that's backed by research. Um, and it's been shown to be effective and it's a certain type of model of therapy. We also have partial intensive outpatient programs where you may go for three or four hours a day, sometimes longer, uh, a few times a week. Um, and that would be different than being there and living there at a, at a program. Residential is uh, for programs where um, it's not totally locked uh, kind of environment, but uh, where um, you, the person goes for groups, but you live there and they're usually between two weeks to six weeks. And then inpatient treatment where uh, someone is, really has a severe um, episode where they may have thoughts of harming themselves or others 
and um, just disorganized uh, behavior and thinking and need to be on an inpatient program, which is usually a locked uh, environment for the safety of, of the patients. So a little bit about medications. There are a number of different classes of medications. Uh, these are prescription psychiatric medications. So there are a number of uh, medications that really can help for um, depression. And they treat uh, depression, sometimes anxiety as well. And sometimes they're used uh, in conjunction with other medications. Anti-anxiety medications. Um, again, these sometimes are fast acting and anti-anxiety for short-term relief, but um, sometimes that can be a problem because they can cause some dependency. So um, a lot of times for anxiety issues, the antidepressants are effective and used. Mood stabilizing medications are usually used for bipolar disorders. Um, and this is where a person may have an episode of mania where they're not sleeping for days on end and having uh, kind of bizarre thinking and thoughts and then uh, an episode of severe depression. Um, so mood stabilizers can can even out the person's mood and help them uh, to live and cope better. And then uh, for psychosis, we have antipsychotic medications, and they treat things like schizophrenia. Sometimes they're also used in conjunction for bipolar disorder, and sometimes in severe depression, they can also be used. So um, those are the general classes, medications. And a lot of times, psychotherapy and medications are used together. That's actually found to be most effective when someone has, uh, maybe the psychotherapy is not working, yeah, it's a medication, and then that really makes it that much better for a person. Or a person is having medications, and they're, they're kind of working, but maybe not as well as you like them to. You can also see a therapist at the same time. So both the psychotherapy and the medications are really felt to be the most effective treatments. A little bit about psychotherapy. So it's also called talk therapy, counseling. Um, and we have a number of different mental health professionals that can do um, mental health treatment. So uh, psychiatrists sometimes provide psychotherapy as well as psychologists, social workers, um, also uh, licensed professional therapists, um, nurse practitioners, um, all kinds of, you know, all kinds of different options for uh, people who provide psychotherapy. Um, psychotherapy can be in group form, one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes family members are included. Um, and a lot of times uh, the psychotherapy can make a difference in, in a couple months. Uh, sometimes it can be longer. It really depends on the condition. It's important that you find a therapist that you feel comfortable and confident to work with. If it's not working out, don't be afraid to kind of decide to switch and maybe see someone else. Uh, some of the newest uh, treatments, well, not all new, but uh, there's some newer treatments for, that are uh, brain stimulation treatments or neuromodulation treatments. A lot of times these uh, can be used for, especially for depression, when the, de the medications or the psychotherapy is not working very well. Then we have things such as ECT, um, repetitive transmagnetic stimulation, which is R, little R TMS. And then there's deep brain stimulation, and vagus nerve stimulation. So um, these are really in more severe cases of depression. And we call that um, cases where uh, the depression is resistant to treatment. And this, these are some other options which have been found to be very effective. So if you're looking for treatment somewhere, um, there is this, uh, uh, SAMHSA has a behavioral health treatment service locator. This goes across the country um, and is, uh, a way to um, find where you might uh, be able to find some treatment in your area. The link is active on, on my slides. And also uh, just wanna advocate that uh, the new crisis line is out there, 988. It used to be this longer number that I don't remember. 
Um, so you don't have to remember that long number. Now it's just 988. And if you're a veteran, you press 988 and then one, and that'll get you to people that work with veterans. So they also have that you can text it, or there's a chat on 988lifeline.org. So um, anybody that's in a crisis and needs immediate services, this is a way way to talk to somebody and you know, talk to people in your um, part of the country, actually, when you call the 988 number. So just kind of summary, um, and again, you know, this, this really is a mental health crisis that we're facing. Uh, there's significant costs that affect um, our, our loved ones and society as a home, as a whole. Um, and uh, we are going through this crisis actually before the onset of uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, and as you can see, um, people are seeking out additional treatment and increased treatment since the pandemic started. So um, we want people to get treatment. The treatment is out there. It's effective. And this will improve our economy moving forward if we can um, really get the word out that people with mental health problems um, can get the help and treatment they need and be part of you know, moving us all forward and having a great workforce. So thank you. I uh, appreciate to being able to talk about these things that I'm passionate about. Um, and um, yeah, I can uh, take some questions. We do have two questions or questions from two different people. The first one being from Anne Marie, which states have the most mental health providers and where is the need? You know, that's a great question. Um, um, it, so some of the data that I saw, the, the places that have the most providers are typically the higher population uh, country uh, states. So California, New York, the larger populated areas actually have the best access uh, for mental health issues. So our rural areas generally have uh, less access and fewer providers. So Northern Wisconsin is really kind of a barren area for people seeking psychiatric care. Um, but uh, generally what I saw like areas like Utah, um, Colorado, North Dakota, uh, really fewer uh, providers in those areas. Wisconsin, uh, we're kind of in the middle of how much access we have as, as compared to the rest of the country. Did I, did I catch, I don't, that seemed like there are two parts of that. Did I get both? Yes, you did. Okay. Last question from Shuck. I'm hoping I did not brutally mispronounce that name, but any measures or statistics about the effectiveness of the mental health services? For example, patients getting back to work, functioning well, quality of life improving, and better relationships, et cetera. So that, that's a really great question. I appreciate it. Um, so um, it, it's it's a complicated answer, though, because uh, it, it really depends. I'm sorry to say that, but, uh, you know, some people with a mild um, a depressive episode and, and they get help right away, um, it's it's very effective uh, psychotherapy and medications and the person could be back on track within a month or two, maybe sooner. Um, some people are dealing with uh, mild um, symptoms and working and, and if they get that help, they hopefully wouldn't even have to not work or, or, or to become a problem. So uh, one so one caveat to this is that uh, seeking treatment quickly uh, when a person has a, a symptoms. Uh, especially when we see our teenagers, adolescents, and younger people, the quicker they get the, the treatment, the better. Uh, so more serious uh, illnesses uh, can take longer and more intensive uh, work. I know uh, for in the VA system, with uh, we have veterans that uh, might be disabled due to uh, severe alcohol, drug problems. We are... Uh, 
about effective for about 30 percent usually uh, uh, we have remission for in their first treatment they might have to go through another treatment to to get better but um, generally 30 to 40 percent of, of people um, experience uh, remission of their symptoms especially around substance abuse uh, with other serious mental illnesses that, that can be a common you know, similar type of uh, results, especially for the really depressive symptoms that are resistant to treatment. So, um, so it does depend, but um, a lot of times uh, people can get better within a few months. And um, sometimes it does take more than just the initial treatment. It may take more than that. And, and so the remission rates really can vary, um, like I said, from the 30% to you know, 100% in, in those more mild cases. So um, I hope that helps kind of answer that. And I guess the, the, the issue is getting treatment is, is really the key here, uh, getting some kind of treatment. Because if you don't, things can sometimes get worse and make it more difficult for us to see uh, improvement. Okay, question from Harriet. For veterans, is mental health treatment free at the VA hospitals or in the VA community services? So um, there's an eligibility criteria for veterans. So uh, it really depends on um, how much time a person, a veteran was in the service. So people that are uh, injured in some way in the service and a service connected for um, any kind of problem, it's 100% that they're covered. Uh, if someone has served, I believe, at least two years as active military. They have uh, a lot of services available. And I think the first year, five years or so, that's free. Uh, in mental health, we have some special provisions recently by Congress where um, even people that have been other than honorably discharged from the military can come to the VA and get help for mental health problems, especially if they're having suicidal thoughts. So Congress has really given us extra provision in getting people help for mental health problems. So if a veteran is not aware, not sure about what services they can get at the VA, the first thing for them to do is, is come to the VA or go through, check our VA website. There's an online ability to check on eligibility and see what they're eligible for. Uh, there sometimes can be some co-pays, but if someone is not, doesn't have the financial ability, there's ways for the VA to help uh, look at that so that they can get services really at very low cost. But uh, many veterans don't have have no cost uh, for their health care at the VA. Okay, we have three minutes left. When you call the 988 number, is this a referral service or does someone provide service at the time over the phone? Someone will provide ser service over the phone. So they will help you deal with the crisis you're, you're dealing with right there on the phone. If you need additional services, they will also do referral. And they're also, um, if someone has a suicidal thoughts and in the middle of a, a suicide uh, attempt, they also can call the local police uh, to do a welfare check. So yeah, they, they will handle a crisis. Of course, if there's a uh, some other emergency crisis, people should call 911. But 988 is is the new number, um, and a and a lot of the, the services are set up so that the the 988 number goes to a call center within the region. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Berger. It was a pleasure having you with us today. Great, thank you. I really appreciate doing this. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Berger. All of us at the National Association of Health Unit Coordinators truly appreciate you sharing your information with us today. We're gonna to take a five minute break, so get up, stretch, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Yolanda Blackston, and I live in Maryland. I am the daughter 
of a pastor. My father-in-law was a pastor and my husband is a pastor. So you can imagine my faith and spirituality is something that's extremely important to me. But one of the other things that I identify with is my mental illness. I live with major depression, generalized anxiety, and ADD. You know, there was a time that I was fearful to disclose my mental illness because of my faith. Several people have the opinion that if I prayed hard enough, I would be cured of all of my sinful diseases. But that's not true. So I came across NAMI. NAMI is a wonderful organization. And what they taught me was that my mental illness is not a character flaw. It is just my makeup. I have brown eyes, brown hair, and I happen to live with several mental health disorders. So with that, it helped me reframe my understanding of the church and mental illness. My belief states that my God is not offended by me seeking therapy. He's not offended by me taking medications as needed for my mental health conditions. Just like he's not offended by me taking medication for high blood pressure, which I also have. So I don't feel like it's a slight and I want to encourage people of faith to reach out. There is no shame in reaching out to a mental health counselor, a therapist, a psychiatrist, even going to your primary care doctor and sharing your concerns. You know, our faith teaches us that we should live an abundant life. So I believe in seeking treatment, it helps me to live an abundant life. And I'm very thankful for NAMI for helping me in my journey to wellness. You may not realize it, but these words, often used to describe someone with a mental health condition, can be very harmful. In a country where one in five people are affected by a mental health condition, it's time for all of us to step up and change the conversation. Just because someone's struggle isn't obvious on the outside doesn't mean they aren't hurting on the inside. We need to see the person, not the condition. Join with me, pledge to be stigma free. we need is your voice, your engagement, your participation, uh, your spreading the word about the important work that you do, um, continue being the valued team member that you are for in healthcare. Um, and as I said, be the voice, get involved, participate. Uh, we, we need every health unit coordinator regardless of their title. We need every person in that role to be part of the association and to just spread the word about, you know, what, what an awesome group we are. Welcome back. Our next speaker today comes from our very own Medical College of Wisconsin, Dr. Himanshu Agarwal. Dr. Agarwal was born in New Delhi, India, and spent his childhood living with his family in Bangladesh, London, Moscow, and Nepal. His formative experiences have helped establish his firm belief that no matter where we reside, we human beings are more similar than different. He attended medical school in New Delhi, India, and then moved to Minnesota, where he completed his psychiatry residency and child psychiatry fellowship. He is also in training to be a psychoanalyst. Himanshu lives in Milwaukee and is an associate professor at the Medical College of Wisconsin, where he sees patients and teaches medical schools, med med medical students, residents, and fellows. 
And now, Dr. Agrawal. Thank you, Christopher, Mr. Anderson. Um, hello, everyone. I'm honored to be here. Um, I'm loving these clips that are being interspersed between the presenters. Uh, before, well, actually, while I populate my or share my screen, my my PowerPoint, if I could uh, request uh, through the chat message, if you could just uh, maybe put in the chat message where you're joining us from what town or city, and if it's outside of Wisconsin, please include the state too. I would love to know kind of a little bit about who's in our audience. And I'm sorry if you already did that and I missed it, I, I joined recently. Let's see if I can look at the... Um, oh, wow. Great. Texas. I'm, I'm looking at the chat now. I can see it now. Wonderful all over. It looks like this is great. Now, Manam Falls, Wisconsin. Great. Atlanta, Georgia. Wow. This is wonderful. Indianapolis. Welcome, everyone. Now, if you wouldn't mind, if you could put in the chat. Oh, we got some international folks from Canada. Welcome, welcome. Um, if you could put in here what your um job description is or your position or your yeah your title uh, what you do for a living i would love to know about that too social worker chaplain nursing instructor nurse practitioner grad tech Psych and P, psychologist or oh, director of partial care. Oh, lovely. All sorts of uh, folks here. And uh, I would imagine, yep, some hucks. Uh, I would imagine um, what we've got in common here is um, uh, that we all are involved in some sort of caregiving professionally. So um, that's what I'm uh, hoping to talk about a little bit today the trauma informed look at the difficult patient. Um, in other words, um, people who may be often called personality disordered um, or uh, things like that. But today I'd like to kind of talk, uh, invite you to, to look at them and, and join me in, in talking about them and exploring them as human beings, as we all are, and see if there's, uh, uh, if there's something that uh, hopefully that you get from this, this conversation. And I want to call it a conversation. I know that you're mostly muted, uh, but I would love it for it to be a conversation. At any point, feel free to put in the chat box any questions or anecdotes that you or, or any responses that you might have. And, and from time to time, I'll ask other Christopher or Janelle to maybe interrupt me and ask if, and, and if there are any questions or, or any comments that, that uh, uh, appeal to them. So before we start, this is the, my, these are my disclaimers and disclosures. Um, don't have any financial disclosures, uh, no conflict of interest that I'm aware of, uh, at least consciously. And then uh, one thing I will, uh, caution you about, and my wife points out all the time, is that it can sometimes come, come across as holy than thou, a little bit so boxy. Uh, but please, if that's how I'm coming across, I hope you won't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, please remember that my intentions here are good. At least that's what I'm. Uh, that's what that's uh, what I'm trying to say. Um, so here's the plan. Here's the agenda today. What I'm hope to do is over the next uh, 40, 45, 50 minutes, introduce the most common stereotypes of difficult people in caregiving professions, um, common myths about such folk, and uh, you know, hopefully that's a conversation between all of us, and then hopefully introduce us at least to the basics of effective versus ineffective strategies, or at least the basic concept that there are some strategies that maybe might be more effective than, than others. At least this is what uh, I believe in based on my, my um, experience and, 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 and uh, the experience of people I respect. And uh, by doing this, we're hoping this will really be a win-win situation. It will be it will uh, achieve a win-win outcome. All goes well. There will be improved outcomes for your clients or patients, uh, respect, depending on what you prefer to call them. Um, there might even be improved job satisfaction for 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 some of you, if all goes well. 
um, and then uh, you know of course uh, really for the A plus hopefully we can achieve world peace. Um, before we start, maybe a little bit of a uh, comedy improv. Well, maybe just just maybe just an association game. Either unmute or uh, put in the chat box. What kind of person comes to mind when you think of a difficult client or patient? Maybe some phrases. Maybe some. Uh, maybe one word. I would love to uh, get kind of uh, our thinking and feeling muscles a little warmed up. Demanding. Thank you. Angry. Yep. Malingering. Thank you. Negative mindset. Yep. I know what I need. Yep. So maybe entitled, sick, angry, and aggressive, unwilling to change. So rigid. Maybe one or two more. This is great. Thank you. Hopeless. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Pe people that are inconsiderate. Well, wonderful. This is, this is, uh, I, I promise I did not plant people to, to put those things in there. Uh, because I, uh, uh, what this tells me is that I think I might have uh, guessed correctly what what the audience here today, the panel here, the participants would like to know about. So um, we're getting. Uh, so the way that I'm looking at it is, uh, uh, there's a three or four different maybe main profiles that uh, the folks that we call difficult uh, might fall under, and so um, you know. Uh, um, this is uh, Dr. Jeannie Mc McDermott. As you can see, she keeps a low profile. She's a brilliant psychoanalyst from the Twin Cities, and she was one of my teachers. And uh, one of, one day she said to me, Manchu, actually, there was a bunch of us, you know, people are like onions. So you keep peeling the layers, and at the bottom, at the center of it, you'll find one thing and one thing only. Now, of course, there might be more than one thing, but but she, she thought there was one thing and one thing only. And so I want to expand on that a little bit. So, you know, I know what I need right now, oppositional, demanding, inconsiderate, you know, the word that might come across for those kind of uh, pa uh, patients or clients might be entitlement. Or, you know, angry, um, aggressive, um, negative mindset. Uh, you might come across as rudeness. And of course, we talked about people that uh, are hopeless or people uh, that are sick, um, resistant, they might come across as clingy. So when I thought about it, these are the three main kinds of folks that I've seen or the uh, three main kinds of behaviors that I've seen that tend to evoke uh, that association with difficult people. I hope that you're following along and, and hopefully you don't disagree too much. So what, according to Dr. McDermott, what she's saying is these are the outer layers of the onion. And so if you keep peeling these layers in the center, you will find one thing and it's right there. I don't know if you can tell, maybe some of you can read really well and uh, have already seen it. It's this and in case you still can't see it. Anxiety, so that's the 1st thing that I want to profess that uh, at the bottom of every single, well, most every um, rude or entitled or clingy person is an anxious person. So that's something that I'd like you to consider. That might be what's at the center of the onion. Um, so if you will indulge me with that theory, we'll move on, okay? Uh, before that, um, I, I wanna introduce uh, another concept, which is why we do what we do. Every single person here, whether they're in a chaplain or a nurse practitioner or a huck or a social worker, et cetera. Ooh, internal comms video producer. Um, we do, uh, we do what we do for a reason and, 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 and to help understand the concept. Here's my friend. Let me ask, let me ask you if you can hear uh, the sound. If someone can just confirm once they can hear the sound. You can't hear the sound? Okay, give me a second here. Let me see here. Uh, I thought I had shared. Uh, switch audio. No, that's not right. I apologize. I'm going to try again. I'm going to try sharing again. And this time I'm going to share with sound. Here we go. Share computer sound. Let's see if this works this time. And I would like 
resounding applause if it works because I'm so bad at this. You might say every one of us is a fiddler on the roof trying to scratch out a pleasant, simple tune without breaking his neck. It isn't easy. You may ask, why do we stay up there if it's so dangerous? Well, we stay because Anatevka is our home. And how do we keep our balance? That I can tell you in one word. Tradition! Tradition! One of my teachers used to say, whenever you're presenting, put things in there that amuse you, that you enjoy. I'm hoping that you're enjoying this too, because uh, that'd be nice. But they said, you know, that way if everybody else had said at least one person liked it, but I'm hoping that you like it too. Uh, kind of uh, introduction to these things in these ways. So, um, what Topol is saying is uh, every one of us, you know, the, 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 wherever we're from, Dallas, Ontario, like um, Wisconsin, Atlanta, whatever we do, uh, video producer, PAC, nurses, nurse practitioners, social workers, we do it, we do this very difficult job because it feels like home. And what helps us balance um, the very difficult job that we do from day to day? Tradition, framework. We like to do things a certain way. And what happens is, uh, is, is people who are difficult, they tend to um, ask or act in a way that challenges tradition. It challenges the order of things. And we don't like that. It, um, would, would would people generally agree with that? Yes, thank you. I'm getting some thumbs up. I thank you for validation. I appreciate it. Uh, also nice to know that not everyone has logged off. Um, so putting those two things together. So firstly, we like tradition. We like things the way we are. We don't like people coming in and ruining our home. Secondly, there's something about perfectly healthy looking, happy people, you know, um, it's as depicted by this very uh, intentionally diverse photograph, uh, stock photo. And there's something that takes all of that group or the people that we serve, people that our clients are patients. And, and uh, when they are faced with anxiety, they turn into Stewie from Family Guy, in, in other words, a temper tantrum throwing baby. What is that thing? Um, it's not tradition, but it's something that rhymes with tradition. And I want to introduce you to that concept. Regression, regression. Regression, regression. For those of you who's uh, Speakers I just blew out, I apologize. Please send the bill to Christopher Anderson at, at Freighted Hospital, MCW. Um, regression. So what is regression? Here's the, here's the definition. Regression is something that's very ubiquitous to all of us. Um, transferring to an earlier stage of psychological development when faced with anxiety provoking stimuli. Now, if we are to remove nerd talk from this, what it basically means is acting like a much younger person because you're stressed out. By definition, I believe that every single patient is at very high risk of being regressed. So by definition, because you work with in the healthcare field or you work with people that are troubled, that are, are going through some kind of uh, medical um, um, situation, that they are regressed or they can be regressed. So that's the next concept I want to introduce is we like tradition. Um, people act a certain way, but at the root of it is anxiety. And when people are anxious, they engage in regression. Hopefully you're following along. 
this with all of this let's get to the kind of workshop the 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 hands-on part i'd like to invite you to play um, a comedy improv game called world's worst those of you that are familiar with the comedy improvisation uh, whose line is that anyway things like that you will see that uh, there's a, a pretty uh, there's a common there's a game they call called world's worst so um knowing that no one would actually say this in real life um, and knowing that I am asking you to exaggerate and be ridiculous, right? Why don't you put in the chat your examples of what the world's worst rude patient, um, what you want to say to them? So imagine uh, the actually, uh, 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 pause for a second. First, let's ease you up a little bit. First, please put in some of the most rude things you've heard from a patient or a client or that you've heard someone else say, or something that you can imagine someone saying. What is What are some of the most rude things? What would a rude patient look like? What would they say? And you can completely make it up. No one will know if this has actually happened here, if this actually happened here or not. You are not doing your job. Thank you, Marlene, for starting us off. I don't know if that was an example or you're telling me that I'm not doing my job. Um, do you even know what you're doing? You have a brain, don't you? Oh, wow, this is getting juicier and juicier. Keep going. That's what I came to you for. You are useless. You don't know me. I hope I'm uh, delivering the intonations well enough. Your job is not important. Ouch. So to a social worker, a patient once told me to leave his room and get him a social worker who's actually old enough to do this job. Wow. Yeah. Oh, uh, Dr. Hilbert's patient brought a beer to session. This place sucks. We have heard this so often, haven't we? I support your hospital. Oh, yep. So maybe some entitlement there. Um, thank you so much. Now, not you, but the world's worst health caregiver. What would the world's worst health caregiver say to that patient? What is the worst thing you can say to them? Feel free to leave. <laughs> that's, that's not even the worst thing. But thank you for starting, starting us up. Yeah. Oh, nothing can help you. Yep. Get well and get out. Wow. This is a very uh, elegant group of people. This is the worst, worst thing that people can say. You're acting like a two-year-old. Okay. You're acting like a two-year-old. Oh, stop being a Karen. Yes. Because that's uh, that's a double hit to to the patient and to all the Karens in the world. People named Karens. Okay. But I want to, I want to, uh, I want to focus on what Roxanne Minor wrote. You're acting like a two year old. So the root patient, when you think about regression, how old do you think they're acting? Three. Yeah. Five. Uh, yeah. Adolescent. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, actually the, the little bit of foreshadowing from, uh, from uh, uh, Roxana was two. We're all this way when we're two. Hence the term terrible twos. So one thing to think about is how old is this person acting? Two. So let me ask you this. If the person in front of you wasn't an associate professor of psychiatry, but they were a two-year-old, and they were saying one of the things to you that you said that you put here, you know, uh, this place sucks. Uh, get me someone that actually knows what they're doing. Instead of thinking of them as an associate professor of psychiatry, what do you think you would say to them if you imagined them to be a two-year-old? What would you say to a two-year-old? Time out. <laughs> yep. Before you say time out, how would you talk to a two-year-old that would be effective? Call their names. Okay, talk to them by their name. Very nice. Get their attention by talking to their name, right? And then it seems like you're having some big emotions right now. Thank you, Angela. Would you like a sucker? Yes, except instead of a literal sucker, you give them what an associate professor of psychiatry wants. So whatever that might be, I understand you're upset. Tell me more. I know it's not comfortable and you'd rather be somewhere else. That's beautiful. So this is how I tried to talk to my two-year-old. I didn't succeed every time. 
but you go to a two-year-old, thank you for all these wonderful, uh, uh, you know, um, um, this engagement. So what you say to a two-year-old is, wow, this really sucks, huh? First, you say their name. I like that. I'm going to use that. You say, boy, you're really upset, aka you're having some big emotions. Would you like a sucker? AKA, would you like me to get you a glass of water or something? And I understand you're upset. You say basically that I understand you're upset. And as Christine pointed out, notice how I'm saying it calmly, even though what you want to say is, don't let the door hit you on the way out or whatever the other wonderful world's worst uh, comments were. It's hard to be too beautiful. Thank you, Anne-Marie. It's hard to be a patient. It's hard to have cancer. It's hard to be sitting in line or sitting in the waiting room for, for 35 minutes. Would you like a hug? Yep, based on where you are, you could absolutely do that. Or a symbol of a hug. Would you like a glass of water? Would you like a magazine? Would you like me to turn the channel to, to something that you like? And then my hope is, and at least my experience has been, for the most part, not every time, you can see uh, the tide turning a little bit, the tide shifting a little bit. And then, as someone pointed out, that's when you say, listen, I really need you to do this, okay? Because otherwise, the behavioral team will come, and I don't want that. Anything else that anyone would want to add to make it even better? Anything that they would do differently? I'm sorry, you're going through this. What can I do to help you feel a little better? Beautiful. So negotiations with the two-year-old, right? Because like someone pointed out, two-year-olds feel, they don't reason. They, so, you know, it's like, is there anything I can do? No, sorry, you can't have that video game again. But is there something else that I can do? Uh, oh, yeah. I, uh, hopefully two-year-olds aren't having video games, but I'm thinking my seven-year-old who sometimes regresses or often regresses to two. Um, thank you for this. Um, if this is making sense, We'll move on to the next kind. I'm looking at the time, I want to be careful about the time too. Now we're going to play the world's worst entitled patient. And a couple of you started us off with the world's worst rude patient. Of course, it can be overlap. So, what are some things that the world's worst entitled patient could say to you, or you could overhear them say? I pay your salary. Yep. Like they literally pay your salary. Oh, sure. So dismissive stuff like, listen, man, don't try to be my shrink. I just need medicine, not therapy. What are you doing for me? Oh, I have been in better places than this. I'll, I'll take that camera and I'll up it. I have left better places than this. You work for me. I'm entitled to the service. I don't care how busy you are. Yep, actually that happens a lot more than we would like hearing that. There's one that, that people haven't mentioned yet that I hear a lot, which is, do you know who I am? That may or may not uh, uh, be the case every time, but I'm entitled for the service. Actually, people say that directly or indirectly, or at least that's how they make you feel. So at what age do human beings feel entitled to everything. So if they're regressing, if our patients are regressing, if a 45 year old associate professor of psychiatry is acting disentitled, at what age do human beings think, okay, hello, I'm hungry. Why isn't it here yet? Boom. Birth. Adolescence, maybe this aggression. Yep. Yep. Infancy. Infancy. Melanie Klein, famous psychoanalyst, called this phenomena king baby. Remember, when we're born, the first year of life, we are all omnipotent. We're all kings and queens and non binary. We all feel entitled to get our diapers changed, to get milk, the moment we imagine it. 
I'm hungry. Boom. Why isn't it here yet? But it can be very hard um, to imagine a fully grown person as a baby. So how do you talk to an infant? That may or may not be useful to kind of talk to them as if they're an infant. Maybe you baby talk or goo goo gaga. But, but actually, when a baby's uh, upset like that, nothing will do. So what you do is, when you think about it, you acquiesce. If it's a king baby, what would you do to an entitled patient if you thought this was royalty? Or they think they're royalty, how do you talk to royalty? So we won't go through the exercise where, where you talk about the worst thing you could say. But uh, how do you approach royalty? I've never approached royalty, uh, at least that I can think of. Well, maybe maybe once or twice, actually back in India. But if you were to approach royalty, if you were to approach the king of England, how would you approach him? Curtsy. There you go. Beautiful. Acknowledge their presence. Respect with respect and dignity. Yep. What with grace? Yeah. And I love the curtsy. So what might you say to them while you're giving the curtsy? One of the best suggestions I ever got. Yeah, it is an honor to meet you. You are right. Wow, this is lovely. And maybe this sounds crazy. Maybe that sounds really ridiculous. Uh, uh, but consider this. Thank them for their time. Yes, please to meet you. You're great. Send the curtsy. Love it. Someone's been watching Game of Thrones. Um, so one of the best suggestions I've ever got in life is uh, use their narcissism as a bootstrap. By this, this is what I mean. You first ask for their permission. You don't tell royalty what to do. You say, may I, may I speak to you? Or um, thank you for your time. Would it be all right if I said a few things? Or to have your permission to speak? Hello, sir, ma'am. How many of us? Yep, right. So you say, and then once they say, yes, I give permission. Then you say, I'd like to say something, but you probably already know this because clearly you're very smart. You probably already know this. However, I was, you know, sometimes the doctors are running late. And uh, um, it makes me so hard to sit here. But as soon as the doctors are here, make sure that you're the first person that they see when it's your turn. So you're basically fluffing them up and you're saying, you probably already know this. You know the medications. Uh, I mean, I understand when you're saying, you know, I came here for um, medication or therapy. And as you probably know, the best way that a medication can be helpful is in addition to therapy. Now be careful um, because be ready to be challenged and say, well, okay, I know I know everything, but how do you know I'm smart? So that's tricky. Therefore, never say anything that you can't back up. Well, you told me which college you went to, and you said you've left better places than this, or you've seen better places. That means you've been to some pretty, pretty, uh, you know, uh, pretty elegant and uh, amazing hospitals. That's what ma made me infer. And that sometimes helps them say, oh, yeah, I, I see. Yeah, you're right. Now be ready. If you're successful, be ready to become the best thing since sliced bread. Be ready for them to be sending lots of people your way and saying, this is the best huck I've ever met, or this is actually not I have ever met. This is the best huck in Wisconsin. This is the best nurse practitioner that's ever existed. Why? Because entitled people, narcissistic people also like to reflect in the glory of others. So they like to, once once you've, uh, you've uh, acquiesced and once you've uh, won them over, once you've started uh, interacting with them effectively, they will like to uh, claim that you're the best so that they can reflect in your glory. See, I see only the best. So remember this, that double is for two. Don't, don't say it and warn you. Um, here's another way to look at it. In the 1980s, there was a movie that came out called The Gods Must Be Crazy. And it was a movie, uh, kind of a documentary kind of movie, uh, a brilliant movie. Uh, about the bush people in Africa. 
And what happens in the movie is that uh, there's two kids, uh, this one and his younger brother, and they get separated from their father in the jungle. And so it's just this boy and his younger brother that are roaming around the uh, jungle all alone. They're lost. And then a hyena comes in front of them. And so the voiceover guy is saying, you know, the young kid suddenly remembers that a hyena never attacks an animal that's larger than it. So what this young kid does is brilliant. He takes this, this piece of tree bark that you can see in the image and he puts it on his head. And the voiceover says, suddenly the hyena is confused. How did this uh, animal that was so small suddenly become so large? Either way, the hyena is not going to try and figure out, uh, not going to take its chances, and the hyena leaves. There's this tremendous, huge hyena with voracious appetite and huge teeth that this kid is able to ward off because it's appearing to be larger than it is. That's the entitled patient. Deep down, if there's some way the next time you see it, an obscenely narcissistic person, if there's some way you can think of this scared little kid inside that's trying to fluff their chest out to show how big and important they are because they're worried about something and they're displacing that on you. The other way to look at it is a pufferfish. For those of you that, that know what a pufferfish is, it's an amazing creature, tiny, flat, but then when it feels it's threatened, it bloats up this air bubbles. There bubbles. Uh, there's little ducts that fill with air, and it completely puffs up, and then startles the prey, the predator. Sorry, it's like whoa! How did it get so big and runs away? So when you think of an entitled patient next time, when you're really, really uh, feeling tempted to put them in their place, please think of this kid. That's who they are deep inside, and sometimes that might be the difference about what you say next. It might be the difference between. Well, if you've seen better places than this, then why don't you go there? From that to, you're right. You've probably seen better places. How may I help you? Actually, may I have your permission to help you? Any thoughts or comments or questions about this? All right, seeing none. I want to introduce you to the, the last person I want to talk about, actually the second last. The clingy patient, and I use this word intentionally, because if we're being honest, that's how we feel. So what are some things that clingy patients might say, or clingy clients, that make you go, oh, man, my day just got longer. Oh, please go away. Oh, this is going to be difficult. Can anyone think of any comments that they might have heard or heard other people or just imagine what it might say? Now, these are the folks that people had uh, described as hopeless, um, demanding in, in a different way. The boy who cried wolf. Thank you, Amber. So, of course, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm inferring from that. It means someone that uh, complains often and oftentimes when you follow the complaint, it's, it's not what it seemed to be. It was a false alarm. Keep calling call beep nonstop. Yes, that's a great example. Nonstop call beep. And then uh, keep you in the room for a long time. Yes, I, I call I call those those kind of in, interactions viscous. It's like viscosity. It's like, it's like uh, uh, maple syrup. Uh, shout out to the Canadian uh, um, guest we have. This is... Uh, just like you know the, the, the thick viscosity where it's like come on it's not it's not going come on let's go let's go let's go go and fall out of the bottle self-fulfilling prophecy oh now we're getting fancy here and and and, and uh, absolutely sometimes when so i think uh, what Anne marie means by self-fulfilling prophecy is if i say to Anne marie Anne marie i know we just met but i know you don't like me and Anne marie's like i just met you how can i not like you well you don't like me everyone else thank you for your comments but Anne marie i know your comments are like this because you don't like me pretty soon you'll be like this guy isn't very likable. So I wonder if that's what you mean by self-fulfilling prophecy. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, asking the same question, trying to get a different answer. Pretending you didn't just have one hour conversation about XYZ. You call the unit post-discharge at 1 a.m. to chat. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, these are great examples. 
right? So what age are these folks acting? So when's the first time that human beings become this clingy in life? So infants are entitled, right? They're king baby. They're not clingy, they're demanding. Give me my food now. At what time, toddlers, right? And, and what, what happens usually in America, especially at the toddler age where they get super clingy and don't wanna leave? After a traumatic event and what is the most common traumatic event? Going to daycare, boom. Separation anxiety or going to school. Thank you, Kamala. Yep. So these are stranger danger. Yep. Which is a little bit different than which, which resurfaces around the time when, when it's uh, along with the, the uh, daycare. So how old? This is a little bit older kid. Sorry, my, my pictures maybe aren't, aren't representative of these kids look older than their stated age, but this is the kid that the first time they're going to daycare, the first time they're being left at school. So if they don't want to go to school, what do you say to them? What does a good enough parent say to a kid who doesn't want to go to school? First day of school, they're scared. Saying, mom, can we just chat here till 1 a.m.? Or, yeah, I, I heard what you said, but I'm going to pretend like I don't have to go to school. This might take a while, I know, for you to type out, but I'll wait. Actually, you know what? I think you get the picture. I think we're on, yep, I know you could do it. I think we're on the same page here. I'm feeling the sync. So I'm going to just say it. And I'm being a little ridiculous here and a little uh, 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 hyperverbose, but here's what, what I would say. No, seriously, you are the one that needs to get this. If they're saying, can you please get this for me? I'm working hard here in my corner, as you can see. However, you are the one that gets to, needs to, score the touchdown you know giving the analogy of football i tried and we all saw how that went if need be so uh, back it up with evidence and even if it had gone well when i tried i signed up to teach you how to fish not to catch the fish for you and you have to say that in a way that is like you would agree with me right like a cheerleader not in like a pandering way or not in an annoyed way i need to make sure <laughs> okay now i'm getting sillier and sillier i need to make sure that unconscious resentment does not come in the way of our work together now, how can I, so that's what you're thinking, but that's not what you're saying. Now, how can I help you succeed? Nope, because of course what they said was, well, can you get it for me? Nope, not gonna do it for you. We already went over this, but here it is again, and then go right back and repeat. In, in the, if you would look at it from a psychopathology lens, which we're trying hard not to, of course, these are the folks that would be called avoidant or dependent. And so sometimes the most, uh, ridiculous, awkward conversations I have in my office are with uh, people that might be like this, where they say, you're the doctor, you decide which medicine. And I say, well, I've given you a few choices. Uh, it's your choice. And I've told you the pros and cons of all of them. Uh, really, you should uh, pick. No, 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 you pick, you're the doctor. And I say, no, 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 you pick, you're the patient. Yeah, but you're the expert on the medication. Yeah, but you're the expert on you. No, doctor, I insist. No, I insist more. And so it just keeps going on and on where to the outside is like, what is going on? Um, and, but you must not relent. It might be, it might take a lot more time up ahead, up front, but as they say, a stitch in time might save nine later on. So those are my thoughts about the three most common kinds of people that I have uh, had the association of difficulty. Now let's talk about the exception. There is an exception. If you come across a person where there's clear evidence and a long-term pattern of antisocial behaviors, of criminality, cheating, lying, stealing, cruelty to animals or children, fire setting, vandalism, these are very specific symptoms. If you're convinced that you're in the presence of an antisocial, then you say, stop. Stop it. So I insist on being called Himanshu. But there's only one time that I insist on being called Dr. Agarwal. And that's if I'm convinced that I'm in the presence of an antisocial. They say, hey, homeboy. Nope. Dr. Agarwal. Oh, I think I'm going to call you Himi. Nope. Dr. Agarwal. And unless 
you call me Dr. Agarwal, we're not gonna start. Well, if you don't treat me, I'm gonna go sue you. Well, that would be a choice, but I'm not budging. Because if you budge, then these exceptions see that as a weakness in you that they can then exploit, which is not good for their treatment. So in the, in the end, the reason that we set limits is actually for their benefit. So even then it's about the patient at the time. I hope this makes sense. But these are the exceptions. Everyone else, if you've ever thought of them as gamey, difficult, manipulative, if there's nothing else that you'll take from this conversation today, I hope you can take this. Please, please consider scratching all of these words from your vocabulary from now till eternity and consider replacing it with this. It feels like a mouthful and awkward at first, but I promise you with practice, it feels sublime. This person has a tendency to use ineffective ways to get their emotional needs met. You don't have to uh, unmute, but just, just for my sake, let's all say it together. I'm just gonna zoom, everyone's gonna say it together. Here we go. This person has a tendency to use ineffective ways to get their emotional needs met. Thank you for the three people who actually went along. I could hear it through the cosmos. That's the one thing I'm hoping that you'll take, if nothing else. So just to summarize, people are like onions. When you think unlikable, think anxiety. That doesn't mean that you have to like them, by the way. You can still say, my God, you don't have to discard those feelings. We're human, but also think anxiety. What could they be anxious about? And then think, how old is this person acting right now? And see if that maybe changes what you're about to say or do next. That's all I got. I'd be happy to uh, put my email address in here if anyone would like to send me questions or suggestions on how I could do this better, et cetera. We only have one question so far, and it's from Christine. Will your slides be available after? I'd be happy to. So what I can do is I can send the, the slides are, because of all the fluff, they're like 50 megabytes. But what I can do is I can uh, convert it into a PDF and send it, send it to Christopher. And then uh, Christopher or Janelle, could you kindly make sure that everyone gets the slide or anyone that wants it? Would that be possible? Yes, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Agrawal. Everyone at the National Association of Health Unit Coordinators and Freighter Hospital does appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us today. So this time we're going to take a 10 minute break, uh, time to refill your water and we'll return then. She's a retired professional wrestler, best known for her time in WWE under the name of AJ Lee. I'm so delighted that we get to share AJ with you tonight. AJ. All right. Do you think crazy is a bad word? I used to fear the word crazy falling from my mouth the same way I would fear dropping a hard F bomb in front of a classroom full of kids. I used to fear being called it, but more so, I would fear being labeled it for life. I think there is a cultural element to the denial and the tough attitude that my, my Puerto Rican family took when it came to mental health issues. I think that's something that's instilled in our culture, in our community. We are a community that is expected to work twice as hard to be seen as equal. And we have to, to speak up and set a good example and be these kind of perfect versions of ourselves for people to not look down on us. Before I even got my first period, I would have my first panic attack. I didn't understand what was happening to me. I woke up in the middle of the night. 
I was shaking, I was sobbing, I was terrified. My mother, who was sleeping right next to me, woke up and she, she opened her foggy eyes and she looked over at me and she asked, what the hell is your problem? And I didn't know what to say, I couldn't find words. And so, so I just sobbed and laid there. And she shuffled over to me and she started stroking my hair and she said, she said, stop acting crazy. I pretended I was okay and I went back to sleep. I didn't want anyone to think I wasn't strong enough to be sane. I remember specifically my family mentioning that therapy and you know treatment for depression, all this stuff were white people problems. You know, we suffer every day. Like we're, we were extremely poor and we were discriminated against and we were um, sort of starting this race, you know, an hour late. And so to complain about something um, that wasn't physical, to complain about something that you couldn't see um, seemed like a problem that people would create um, when they didn't have anything else to complain about. Um, of course, that's not true, which we found out the hard way. Um, but for so long, you know, we were this family that thought you, you create your own destiny, you can tough it out, you can just get over stuff if you're feeling sad. Six months into my first year at NYU, my mother would end up in a psychiatric hospital. After hiding her own depressive symptoms for years, she would eventually learn the hard way that she was living with undiagnosed and untreated bipolar disorder. And then one day, I woke up in the hospital too. At the age of 19, I had overdosed. In a haze of overwhelming pain and confusion, I had taken an almost lethal amount of pills. I had tried and failed to take my own life. Lying in a hospital bed with thick black track marks running down my arms from all the IVs poking and prodding my veins, that was the lowest point of my life but I survived. And in surviving, I was forced to make a choice. Would I go on pretending, or would I face my truth? I remember when I first got my diagnosis, and I thought that my life was over. I thought that having a professional tell me that I, I had bipolar disorder meant that I was going to be limited in some way. And then I looked back at my life and I realized that it was sort of my saving grace the whole time. Um, I always say I've been given the gift of extraordinary emotions. It's, it's not this affliction. It is such a gift for me. Um, it's made me extremely passionate and dive into life head first. And I have this iron will and um, sort of this belief in the impossible because I have bipolar disorder. Um, it has made me see the world in more vibrant, more beautiful colors. Um, and if I didn't have it, I don't know if I would be here today. I just think I would have been sort of lost. It, it gave me direction. It really made me think that I could be a superhero. I wrote a book called Crazy is My Superpower. And when I was about to put this book out into the world, I was kind of terrified. <laughs> um, I did not know how I would be received. Um, I had spent so long playing this, you know, kind of tough character that to be so vulnerable was scary. Um, but I, I should have known better because my fan base supported me for so long because I was different. I was someone who had these things that were traditional flaws, but I embraced them and I was proud of them. You know, I was proud to be scrawny and to not look like the supermodels. And I was proud to wear cheap clothes and sneakers. And um, I embraced these things that, you know, other people sort of made fun of me for. And so when I came out with this book and I was exposing something, I was so scared. I thought people might kind of point a finger and, and reject me. Um, just to see how people embraced me and they continue to just say, oh, this is another thing that, that we accept you for. 
and that we're gonna celebrate this difference because we understand it. Because so many of, of my fans have dealt with these issues. They also have had anxiety or depression. Um, and that was kind of amazing. It, it, was, it was my goal to let people know that I, was, I didn't just have a mental health disorder and, and I got through it. I credit my, my bipolar disorder for everything I was able to accomplish. I didn't find success in spite of it. I found it because of it. Um, and that was my message. And I think people got that. And that was really exciting. <laughs> I would tell any Hispanic family that it is, it takes so much more strength, it is so much braver to ask for help, to talk to each other about what you're experiencing. We really ignored these feelings that were dangerous and we had to wait until we hit absolute rock bottom to kind of wake up and snap out of that and realize that machismo is not worth it. Um, we don't have to be tougher. We don't have to be quiet. You know, s strength does not have to be synonymous with silence. Because having a tougher life, being discriminated against, kind of starting, you know, a few feet behind in a race, um, it has an effect on you. It takes its toll. And the more we can reach out and get help, the better we will be for that. And we're back. I'd like to introduce our final speaker today. M. Scahill is the Director of Public Awareness and Education at Mental Health America. She develops educational resources for MHA's awareness initiatives, including Mental Health Month, National Family Caregivers Month, and Youth Mental Health. Prior to this role, M was the manager of peer advocacy support groups at services and continues to integrate the values of lived experiences and self-directed care in her work. M graduated from Northeastern University with a degree in communication studies and psychology. Her lived mental health experiences has made her a passionate advocate for stigma reduction, increased accessibility to services. So please welcome today, M Scahill. Right, there we go. Now I'm unmuted. Oh, but I stopped my video. All right, perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here today and close out these fantastic sessions. Um, we've got a lot of caregivers on today, a lot of healthcare professionals. I'm really excited to be talking to you guys. You're a group of people who can have such an impact on our systems of care by paying attention to mental health, both your own and the patients you interact with. Um, so great to be talking to you all. A little bit more on me. I led MHA's COVID response um, and one of our population focuses was healthcare workers. And as someone working in mental health, I know those of us in helping professions can have a tough time admitting when we're the ones who need help. 
um, when we can't come to the rescue. But you can't get better if you don't acknowledge that something's wrong and you deserve to feel well. So who is MAJ? Mental Health America was founded back in 1909 and it was really the beginning of the mental health hygiene movement. Our founder Clifford Beers in 1908 published his book, A Mind That Found Itself, detailing his experiences in numerous asylums. And it's no secret that back in that time, mental health treatment could be pretty horrid. Um, he launched one of the earliest client advocate health reform movements in the US. And so we really carry this advocacy work into our work today. We believe that mental health is a human right and taking care of yourself should not feel impossible or confusing or traumatizing. And so to do that, we have to start early. We start with our this four stage four philosophy, the idea that mental health conditions should be treated long before they reach the most critical points in the disease process. When we think about things like cancer, heart disease, any type of physical illness, we never tell people that they're not sick enough for treatment. You'd never turn someone away for stage one cancer. But a lot of times you'll go into a therapist's office and you'll talk about mild anxiety, mild depression, and you will get turned away. You won't be referred to medic for medication. You won't be referred for consistent therapy. And it'll be, you know, come take care of yourself. Come back if it gets worse. Um, but we really need that early intervention, those prevention services, getting in and getting people early in that process um, so that they can, they can live fulfilling lives. So now to get into the good stuff. There we go. Um, we'll start with some basic definitions to orient us, get us all on the same page. We'll talk about the social determinants of health and what role they play in empowerment. Um, we'll talk about maintaining mental wellness, recognizing when you need additional support and figuring out what your options are. And then we we'll, should have some time for Q&A at the end. So to start, what is mental wellness? Often when we talk about mental health, we're actually talking about mental illness, which allows people to think that mental health isn't for them. Something that we say a lot at MHA, and one of my favorite things to say is one in five people have a mental illness, which is a stark statistic, um, but five in five have mental health. That's everyone, that's you. So what is wellness overall? It's holistic. And I'll get more into this later, but it really focuses on overall health and your entire experience in life versus just one aspect. Mental wellness is that emotional and behavioral aspect of well-being. You can work towards this wellness through life skills, um, that focus on well-being, promote well-being, and prevent the onset of illness, as well as social policies that reduce exposure to risk, like toxic stress and trauma. And so for individuals who have become ill, who have already passed that wellness stage and are working on getting back to recovery, wellness, the idea of wellness seeks to shorten the duration of illness and the disability that may result from it. So some parts of mental wellness Focus, resilience, which is, you know, stress management, distress tolerance, confidence and self esteem, social support and community and belonging, feeling like you have you have a group, you have people. Having a sense of purpose, having hope and optimism, gratitude and self control, all big parts of your overall mental wellness. And keep in mind, part of being human is that your mental health is in constant flux. It ebbs and flows on a daily basis. You are never going to feel all of these things all of the time. And that's okay. That's not the goal. <clears throat> so what is self-empowerment and how does this fit in? Making a conscious decision to take charge of your own life. That's what self-empowerment is. It's not just about making you feel more comfortable and secure in who you are. That's definitely part of it. Um, but it's more about opening your eyes to how many choices you have. The fact that you have power, you have the capacity and the means to choose and act how you please and to act in your own self-interest. This concept was actually a massive turning point for me in my own mental health journey. Um, I had a therapist in college who called me out and was like, you're talking like life just happens to you. Like you can take an active role in living it. And that stuck with me. That was like, oh my God, you're, you're right. I'm kind of just like when bad things come up, I'm just like, oh, okay. Like, I guess this sucks instead of like, okay, yeah, this, this happened. This does suck. And I can choose how I react to it, how I respond to it. So it builds self empowerment builds into wellness as a means of illness prevention and as a motivator for self care and healing. I mentioned earlier that part of achieving wellness needs to be done through social policies. So I want to add a massive disclaimer here. The concept of self empowerment is so important and I truly believe it's a game changer in helping people seek out treatment and 
there are so many systems of oppression that impact people and intentionally disempower them. So just as there are social determinants of health, there are social determinants of mental health. I have a bunch listed on the screen for you. Um, and these things can serve as protective factors or risk factors for developing a mental health concern, but they're all part of the picture. And they're not only part of the picture, but like I mentioned, they can actively disempower individuals. And that's not because of things like their sexuality, their gender identity, their race. It's because of the societal structures around those things. And it can really hold these people back from being able to find accessible treatment and healing. So that's something to keep in mind for you as a healthcare professional as you interact with patients or talk to really anyone about your mental health and as well as for yourself as you navigate your own mental health, keeping in mind your identities, your history, what is playing into your, your own wellness. So maintaining mental wellness, if you're doing well, how do you keep it up? Um, when we, you go to the gym to take care of your physical health, you get exercise, you keep up with your physical health. Um, but we don't always do that with mental health. We think of therapy or treatment as something that you only do once you're in crisis mode. So with all those systems and structures at play, how does empowerment fit in? We can keep up wellness through self-awareness and through self-care. Self-awareness is the ability to observe, identify, and understand your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions. So it's really about distancing yourself from yourself, from your own mind. I love this quote from Michael Singer's The Untethered Soul. The whole book is fantastic if you haven't read it. Um, but there's nothing more important to true growth than realizing you are not the voice of your mind. You're the one who hears it. You aren't your mind telling you that you botched a big project or that no one likes you. Your mind is its own beast. You can listen to it, give yourself permission to listen to it, but observe it first. Where is this coming from? Is it right? Is there any evidence? And maybe there is. Part of awareness is recognizing when your mind is right, processing that and figuring out how to respond. If you're really looking for self-awareness of yourself and who you are um, and that healthy baseline, what is, your, what is your typical baseline? So how do you figure that out? How do you develop the self-awareness? Check in with yourself regularly. Regularly meaning daily if you want to do that, weekly if that's more reasonable for you. Um, but checking in on how your body feels. Are you feeling tense? Are you feeling jittery or shaky? Are you tired? What thoughts are on your mind? What's kind of spiraling around in there, whether it feels related to anything going on or not? What emotions are you experiencing? And those are different than, than thoughts. You can have an emotion and not have a thought connected to it. That's okay, you wanna look for those because those are still impacting you. And what are you doing in this moment? Are you alone? Are you with people? Are you, did you just eat a big meal? Are you overtired? What else is playing into, into how you're feeling? Talking to people you trust is another great way to develop self-awareness. Um, you can't know everything about yourself. You cannot be totally objective. Yes, that's what we're trying to do with self-awareness. It's not possible to see yourself from a completely different point of view. So go to a close friend, a trusted colleague, someone whose opinion you value and trust and respect and see how they would describe you. Ask how you can better support them, how you can be a better friend to them. Ask how they see you shining at your best um, and get kind of a, a take on how, how other people view you. And again, that is that plays into self-awareness, but it is not everything. You know who you are. Um, and so if something, you know, someone sees you in a different way than you see yourself, take that and observe that information, process that information, but you do not need to accept it. Don't bury the hard stuff. Um, this is the tough one. Unpacking the pains from your past. Um, a lot of times, a lot of people have past trauma um, that they have not processed and that if you don't process and you don't heal it, it sticks with you. Um, even if it doesn't feel like it's coming up regularly, it's that kind of underlying foundation that's you know threatening your, your own internal safety and security. So working on that is a great way to really dig into who you are, what's impacting you, and really get familiar with yourself. Um, identifying weaknesses and strengths too. Keep like focus on the positives as well. Um, and pushing yourself to engage in different conversations or difficult feelings. Um, it's really easy to run away from hard feelings, feeling anxious and turning to alcohol or feeling sad and binge eating or watching TV for hours and hours and hours. Um, 
but pushing yourself to have hard, hard conversations with people. Um, if you're feeling sad because you're left out, talk to that person, ask why you were excluded um, and really dive into, dive into those conversations. And then meditation, another fantastic way to improve your self-awareness, um, especially your in the moment awareness. And this connects uh, very closely with checking in with yourself, um, but sitting still and comfortably focusing on your body and your breath just five minutes a day can make a massive difference. You can just sit there, you can set a timer. There's tons of guided meditations on YouTube or apps um, that are helpful if you prefer to have someone kind of guide you through it. But another great way to, to check in with yourself. Moving into self-care. Overall wellness is comprised of eight interdependent dimensions. So you have physical, emotional, intellectual, social, spiritual, occupational, environmental, and financial. If any one of these dimensions is neglected, it'll adversely affect your health, your well being, your quality of life. And each of these dimensions has a huge impact on your mental well being specifically. So you're looking for a well rounded balance of these wellness dimensions. That's what's going to provide holistic health, holistic harmony to your own well being. So, how do we do that? Through self care. A lot of the time we think of self care as treating yourself. And while that can definitely be true, it's critical, critical to make sure the basics are covered first. So these are really the essential, essential parts of meeting your own needs. Food choices and nutrition. Your gut is your second brain. It communicates with your actual brain. And eating nutritious meals is the best way to keep your gut microbiome healthy and in check. Physical activity. Staying active improves self-esteem, brain function, sleep, social withdrawal, stress such an important thing to keep keep up with regularly getting out there every day try to get outside um get some of that sunlight very important for self care sleep another big thing helps to regulate mood ability to learn and make memories and all of the cognitive functions that's where a lot of brain fog can come from um so best sleep practices being in a cool dark and quiet room really important to get quality sleep not just quantity um, so that means being asleep for about 85% of the time that you are in bed and um, falling asleep within 30 minutes. So keeping a, keeping a pulse on how your, how your sleep is doing. And then making sure you have a support system. Humans are social beings. Our brains are wired to seek connection. So having people support you during hard times is a big factor in protecting your long-term mental health. Um, and then on the flip side of that, isolation is a huge risk factor for developing a mental health condition, mental health concerns. So uh, spending time with friends, getting out into community is a big part of self-care. It is not, uh, you know, one of those just a fun, oh, if I have time, I can do that. It's important to build that time in. Sometimes self-care, though, has to be a bit more reactive and in the moment. It's not all about the basics. Um, so things like deep breathing can be relaxing, can help bring you down from high emotions. Same thing with meditation and yoga. Like I mentioned, there's a bunch of free stuff online. Um, I put on the, on the slide here, four, seven, eight breathing. That's one of my favorite things to do. So you breathe in for four, hold for seven, and breathe out for eight. And you can do that three times, five times, set a timer for 10 minutes and lose yourself in it. That's another great way to meditate is find a breathing pattern and just focus on the breathing pattern. If you're not someone who likes to hear voices of guided meditations, focus on your breath. Um, taking a shower or a bath, often water can feel relaxing and cleansing, um, or maybe you feel more connected to the earth. So if you can get outside and put your bare feet or bare hands on dirt or grass or a tree, that's often a great way to help ground you. Gratitude, this can be the little things like I saw a beautiful orange bird yesterday or the big things like I'm healthy, I have a home. Uh, writing it out or journaling, I speak out loud. I don't like to handwrite things. So I will either pretend I'm having a conversation with someone or I will just monologue to myself and getting it out from head into the world, into words um, is one of the best ways I have found to help process my feelings. Taking a nap, sometimes you just need to reset, and that's okay. Um, and so many other things. Anything that feels good to you um, can count. So coloring, puzzles, talking to friends, reading, exercising, 
whatever feels like taking care of yourself to you and helps you, that's valid. So self-care isn't always enough. Sometimes our mental health starts to slip and we have to really work to help it rebound. But you can't do that work if you don't realize that you're struggling. The average delay between someone first experiencing symptoms and them receiving treatment is 11 years. 11 years. And why is that? Of course, there's, you know, it's confusing. There's health insurance issues. There's access issues. Um, but there's also just information issues, health literacy issues. A lot of people don't know that they can feel better. Oh, we got some fun transitions here. Um, I post a lot on my personal social media about mental health and often post the link to MHA's mental health screens. And maybe two or three years ago, a close friend of about 10 years, someone I was very close to, we've talked about mental health plenty of times, mostly my mental health. Um, and a few years ago, she texts me and she's like, oh my God, I just randomly took those depression and anxiety screens that you posted, not expecting anything. And I screened as likely to have severe anxiety and severe depression. And she had no idea, her mind was blown. And that conversation I had with her after that was one of the most fascinating conversations I've ever had. Cause she's like, I, just, I had no idea that this wasn't just normal life. I thought everyone felt like this all the time. Um, and she started therapy after that. She's been in therapy for two or two years or so um, and is doing so much better and had a conversation with her recently where she was like, I can't believe I thought, I thought that was just how it was. I had no idea that I could feel any better. So how do you recognize when you need help? Um, so I have some con common symptoms of mental health challenges on the left here. Isolation, losing interest in things that previously interested you, anything like food, hobbies, TV shows, friends, um, trouble focusing, a short temper, lack of motivation, risky behaviors, um, that can include financial, like spending, intense fear and worry that's impacting your daily life, and then big changes in hygiene, sleeping, and eating or habits. And so what can we do? Think about your daily life. Think about your typical mood, your energy level, your appetite, your sleep routine, your social life, your physical health. It's so many things to think of, but so many things go into mental health. So is your has your mood changed? Has your energy levels changed? Are you no longer eating as much as you used to or you're way hungrier? Um, or maybe you're hungry, but nothing sounds good. You can't think of anything that you are willing to eat or could stomach right now. So keeping an eye on, on those things. And then learning about mental health conditions. So looking up different mental health conditions, seeing the symptoms of specific ones and finding if there's anything that aligns with how you're feeling. One very easy way to do that is through MHA screening. Um, so in 2014, MHA launched our online mental health screening, which is a collection of online, free, confidential, anonymous, scientifically validated screening tools um, to help people understand and learn more about their mental health. It's a great way to keep a pulse on how you're doing. You can track changes, get objective results. Um, so since we launched in 2014, over 15 million screens have been taken over 5 million in 2021 alone. And so we found ourselves unintentionally sitting on the largest data set ever collected from a help seeking population, which has been really cool because then we're able to create resources that are very responsive to your needs. So what are the benefits for you of screening regularly? People who screen regularly are more attuned to their symptoms because you're checking in, you're familiar with the symptoms you're thinking about if they're impacting you regularly. You're more knowledgeable about their conditions. You're better able to communicate with their provider. So that is something to keep in mind with these screens. They're not a diagnostic tool, but you can print it out and bring it to your provider. Um, it is the same exact screenings that your pro provider would give you. Um, and that's, it's a great place to start. You have that information right there about how you're feeling. Better able to recognize improvement early in treatment, which is huge. It doesn't sound like it would necessarily be a big deal, but being able to recognize improvement early is a huge factor in keeping up with treatment. They're more aware of the warning signs of relapse, so can catch themselves a lot quicker and are better able to self-manage the mental illness that they have. 
So then what? If you know your mental health isn't a good spot, what are your options? There are a lot of really neat wellness tools out there, and I know I'm biased, but the MHA screening site, after you take one of those mental health screens, it will connect you to information, resources, and tools that help you understand and improve your mental health based on your screening results. So based on what test you take, whether you take the um, substance use one or the depression one or the psychosis screen, you will be directed to relevant resources. Um, as well as relevant based on your results. If you screen for mild anxiety, um, you're going to get different content than if you screen for severe anxiety. Most online mental health information is targeted to people who already know what they're looking for. So a lot of language understood only by mental health professionals and longstanding clients. Um, and then the other big thing is they assume that the reader is ready and willing to seek professional treatment. Um, and so we took a different approach because not everyone is there. So we meet people where they are. Not everyone who experiences mental health challenges is ready to access professional treatment. Um, so this site has a lot of options, uh, clarifies those options, talks you through how you can utilize those options um, and what the, what the path would be for you there. Um, and the, the big part of it is giving you a starting point. No one resource is going to solve anyone's mental health problems, but this information, seeking out your own information and getting those resources can help you start to take charge. Opening up to someone you trust, just naming what's going on with you is a great way to start. Um, and if it's overwhelming, you can write it down at first, write notes, send a text if that's easier. And then tracking your mood and energy to find patterns, similar to what we were, I was mentioning earlier. Um, but if you are, if you notice that your mental health is slipping, start tracking those things. Start tracking your mood and energy. Those are the two big ones to keep an eye on with mental health challenges. And then anything else that feels relevant to you. I know when I get really anxious, my appetite plummets. So if I start to notice myself getting more anxious, having a, entering a more anxious phase, um, I'll start tracking my appetite as well. So no matter who you are, sometimes you need extra help. Sometimes the self-help isn't enough. So what kind of treatment is even available to you? The traditional mental health care system doesn't meet everyone's needs. So we've got therapy, we've got medication, and those are great places to start. Um, but most of the Western healthcare industry has taken this medical model of understanding and treating health conditions. Um, so a focus on diagnosis and symptom management. And with mental health, that really ignores the social factors, the cultural factors, the historical factors that impact the mental health of many communities that have traditionally been marginalized. Um, so there are so many other treatment types um, available to you. It is not just therapy and medication. There is peer support. So connecting with other people who have similar lived experiences um, and are not coming, are not speaking to you from the point of a clinician, but from the point of a peer. Um, Community-based services. So different services within your local community. Alternative medicines. Um, I will drop a link in the chat later, but we have a great page on the MHA website listing a ton of complementary and alternative medicines. Um, support groups, another great way, kind of bridge that, that um, gap between therapy and peer support where you're surrounded by other people who are experiencing similar things, um, but typically have a clinician leading the group or someone more trained leading the group. Um, and then culturally based practices. Um, that's a bit more about what I was mentioning earlier. If you go to mhanational.org slash July, um, we have our BIPOC Mental Health Month campaign up on there um, from the past years. And I think it was our 2021 toolkit focused on different types of care that are outside of the, the typical medical model. Um, and so keeping in mind that there are there are other options for you. Community care is valid. Culturally based practices are valid. Self-directed care is valid. And then finding treatment. Where, where do you go to actually find that treatment? So your primary care provider is a great first step. Local community centers um, can often direct you to other resources, whether those are um, therapy and medication clinicians 
or support groups, more um, peer support, less conventional uh, treatment models. If you go to cdsdirectory.org, that is a fantastic directory of peer run services. So if you're someone who really wants to connect with um, someone else with lived experience, someone else who has gone through what you're going through, what you're feeling, uh, that's a great place to start. Findtreatment.samsa.gov, um, another great resource that has really everything that, that you'll need. It's kind of a one-stop shop um, that you can start with. And then mhanational.org slash findaffiliate. Um, MHA, I'm, I work in the national office where we do primarily policy and education. Um, we have around 150 affiliates throughout the country who are more state-based, more community-based and do direct services. Um, so if you go to that find affiliate site, you can find a local affiliate and many of them have programs that they offer there. A number have programs that are offered for healthcare professionals. Um, and they can also help direct you to other, other information, other services. Um, our affiliates are really wonderful and really serve as community hubs for all things mental health. So that is a great place to go if you're looking for more tailored individual help where they can help, help you figure out what kind of help you even need. And that is all I have for today. So we can move into Q&A if there are any questions. Does not look like you have any questions, so thank you very much. Thank you. We do have one question from Christine. Oh. Sure. Um, let me get back to there. Can you share your favorite medication app? Ooh, good question. I am a fan of Headspace and Calm. I, I believe they definitely both have free options. Um, Headspace, actually both of them might have, they both did during COVID um, have free subscriptions for healthcare providers. Um, they may still, so that's definitely worth checking out. Thank you, Em. All of us at the National Association of Health Unit Coordinators and Freighter Hospital appreciate you sharing your that knowledge and expertise. I would like to thank all three of our presenters today for their time and dedication, not only to this webinar, but also the, to the field of mental health. Each attendee today will receive an invitation to the feedback survey in your inbox. This will not only provide the valuable feedback we need, but also will be your application to continuing education credits. So please don't discard it. Information will be on the next screen and we'll keep it up for 15 minutes. I hope that everyone here found this to be valuable, informative and useful, not only for your workplace, but for yourself as well. Thank you all for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for watching this webinar. To earn NAHUC content hours, visit www.nahuc.org. That's www.nahuc.org and look for the Education Continuing Education tab. Click on NAHUC's Virtual Lending Library to access the post test and instructions on how to submit to earn NAHUC content hours email office at nahuc.org or call or text 815-633-4351 with any questions. 
All of this information is on this slide. Thank you.